Good morning. Uh, I told Pastor earlier, this has kind of my, um, been a while I haven't preached. <laughs> but um, I praise the Lord for this privilege and this opportunity um, to be able to impart to you, to share to you God's Word today. Pastor read Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. And uh, let's go to chapter 1. And then I'll read one verse and then we'll pray. Habakkuk 1, or chapter 1, verse 1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. Father, we humbly come to you today. And we thank you that in your grace and mercy that you have redeemed a people for your own, for your own glory and honor. Lord, as we study this passage, I pray for your Holy Spirit's visitation upon each one. Help us be able to understand your word and help me as the one who will share it be able to explain it in the simplest and clearest manner. We ask, Father, for your mercy and forgiveness. And that's what the psalmist has prayed, create in us a clean heart and renew the right spirit within us. You have renewed our hearts. You have given us the new heart. In fact, you have written your law upon our hearts because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done on the cross. In whose name? I commit to you all these things. Amen. Now, we are all familiar that Israel has a very colorful history. Beginning from the Exodus, the wanderings, we go to the judges, and then the kings. Now, if you remember that Israel, in the time of Samuel, who believed to be the last judge, they were asking, Samuel, we want a king. God said, Samuel, they did not reject you, they rejected me. They were given a king. We have King Saul, who started well, but unfortunately ended miserably. Here comes David. David, who was called as God's, or or, a man after God's own heart. But when he died, he died with a broken heart. If you remember that the sword did not depart from his house, if you remember that, God said to him, Solomon came in. And when he started with his reign, it was probably called, they call it as the golden age of Israel. Why? Because of the economic prosperity and the peace. That was actually a preparation from David. David's time. If you read 1 Kings, that silver and other precious stones were just ordinary during the days of Solomon. It was during that time when the temple was built. It took seven years. But take note, Solomon's house was finished in 13 years. Well, we all know the story, right? Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I don't know how he could cope up with it, but maybe he come to number one three years after, right? You don't know. But that was, aside from that, look at the positive side of it. Solomon was known for his wisdom. He started well, but again, ended up miserable. After him came Rehoboam. 
And that was the beginning of the, the division of the kingdom. Once a united kingdom was divided now to a northern and southern kingdom. Samaria, being its capital, had ten tribes. The southern kingdom had two tribes, Judah and Bethlehem, and Jerusalem as, as its capital. So therefore, the kings that were in the uh, northern kingdom, unfortunately, were all ungodly. And by the years, seven, around 720 B.C., God used the Assyrians as his rod of punishment to the northern kingdom. Now, the Assyrians, um, I'm not going to elaborate more on how, how, what this type of people are, and just imagine, just if you read Jonah, the very fact that Jonah was upset in the Lord for, say, for, for granting them mercy, it tells a lot. He doesn't want the Ninevites to be saved. Because they were, they were known as, as, wow, they would do terrible things to their captives. Now, in the southern kingdom, fortunately, there were godly kings. Now, maybe you're familiar with the name Hezekiah. Maybe you're familiar with the name Josiah. In fact, uh, some scholars believe that the prophet Habakkuk ministered after the time of Josiah. Now, we have here before us a prophet. Now, he's one of the prophets that God sent both to the northern kingdom and to the southern kingdom. God was faithful. Faithful in reminding the nation of Israel, both the northern and the southern kingdom, of their sins. Their sin of idolatry, their sin of extortion, their sin of injustice. But there was also a faithful call or calling by God to, for them to repent, come back to Him. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the northern kingdom was invaded by the Assyrians, and they were taken captives, while the southern kingdom was in the later years. Now, um, there's a lot of debate regarding the dates of, of um, the writing of this book of Habakkuk. And, um, but I, I would submit to you that this was probably during the time after the king Josiah. Now, who is Habakkuk? Unfortunately, we don't have any, any uh, information aside from this one in the book. Some uh, in, 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 in Jewish, um, I don't know if you heard about Bell and the Dragon, um, an apocryphal book, which is, of course, not included here in the canon, but the character Habakkuk was mentioned um, where he was making a stew and an angel appeared, and basically the angel told Habakkuk, bring that stew to Daniel, who was at the time was in the lion's den. So the description was the angel took him by the crown of his head, and then with a split second, he was there already before Daniel. And Daniel, take the stew. And then he went back. I know that's, that was a weird story, but um, <laughs> they were really trying to 
give us information about Habakkuk. But Scripture would just say he was a prophet. It says here, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. What's an oracle? Well, it's interesting because in, in, in the Hebrew, it means burden. A heavy load. And as we will can, we'll look into the passage, we will see the burden here of Habakkuk. What he saw and what he witnessed during his time. Now it just reminds me, I know this is a side note, but this reminds me it personally when I was studying it uh, this past week how that our pastors are carrying a burden. That burden for God's people. That is the burden even of bringing to us God's word. And Habakkuk has this burden. The same thing with, with what Nahum started, how he started, the oracle. It's a burden. Because it's not a good picture. How they were longing for God's justice. Look at here. This is a dialogue between the sovereign God and his grieving prophet. Now we'll look at the dialogue here. Look at the, the complaint by the prophet. Now, if you notice, Habakkuk is sort of kind of different from the way the prophets, you know, gave their message. Um, the same with, uh, I think it's Habakkuk and Jonah. But aside from that, the common content of the prophets, if you notice it, thus Thus saith the Lord. In Habakkuk, it's different. We have here a prophet not giving out the message from God, but he's presenting before God his complaint. Look at verse 2 and verse, up to verse 4. Look at his first complaint. He says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? O cry to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. The issue, he started, how long? The question is, how long, Lord? Why, Lord? There's a resemblance there from the Psalms. What was some of the issues that the psalmists have, have written? How long, O oh Lord? Why, Lord? Where are you, Lord? He was grieving here. And this is an honest to goodness grieving. We don't have here a, a, a picture of, of, of the prophet who seems to, you know, Lord, come here, listen to me. No, that's not the kind of attitude. He was Pleading here before God, because you'll notice that in verse, uh, from verse 12 and verse 13. What was his complaint? He complains of violence. In Micah chapter 6, verse 12, it says here, your, your rich men are full of violence, your inhabitants speak lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. He complained, Habakkuk complained of iniquity, means evil or wickedness. The same issue even during the time of Jeremiah, because they were prophesying in the southern kingdom. 
Jeremiah said, If only my head were a pool of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, I would weep day and night for all my people who have been slaughtered. Oh, that I could go away and forget my people and live in a traveler's shack in the desert, for they are all adulterers, a pack of treasures, treasures lies. Liars, my people bend their tongues like bows to shoot out lies. They refuse to stand up for the truth. They only go from bad to worse. They do not know me, says the Lord. Beware of your neighbor. Don't even trust your brother. For brother takes advantage of brother, and friend slanders friend. They all fool and defraud each other. No one tells the truth with practiced tongues. They tell lies. They wear themselves out with all their sinning. They pile lie upon lie and utterly refuse to acknowledge me, says the Lord. Habakkuk complain also of injustice. This was also the cry of Micah in chapter 7. Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul des desires. The godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts the other with the net. Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul, and they weave it together. That's why here at back in verse 4, so the law is paralyzed. Justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Did God just remain silent? Listen to how the Lord responded, His response in verse 5 through 11. I like this when, if, if you recall the book of Job, when God finally answered in chapter 38, it was like so dramatic, it was so powerful. I don't know how the Lord appeared to Habakkuk, but it, here he says, listen, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. This was quoted by the Apostle Paul in Acts 13 in the context of the gospel. And here, it says in verse 6, For behold, God said, I am raising up the Chaldeans. Now, if you were in Habakkuk's uh, uh, place, when you hear the Chaldeans, they were a rising power during the time of Habakkuk. And if you continue to further read here, God described in some figure of speech, metaphor of how arrogant, how powerful is their military. And if you're Habakkuk, you are really scared. Why? He says here, verse 6, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march throughout the, bre the bread of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Look at the military might here. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They, ga they, they gather captives like sand. At kings, they scoff. This is their arrogance. And at rulers, they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. Wow. Now,
If you were Habakkuk, I don't know how would you respond with that reply from God. Was Habakkuk satisfied by God's answer? I don't think so because it resulted to another complaint. Look at verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established established them for reproof. You who are purer of eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up? And this is the, the, the second complaint. Now we have to note that we have here a prophet who, who recognized the character of God. He says, Lord, you're from everlasting. You're eternal. You're the Lord my God. You're my Holy One. You know that my Holy One is, is, is a name, one of the names of God in the book of Isaiah. You can read that. My, my Holy One. The Holy One of Israel. And he recognized the sovereignty of God. He says, oh Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment. And you, O rock, have established them for reproof. But then he says, you who have a pure eyes and to see evil cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up? The first complaint was this. Lord, I am witnessing this injustices, this oppressions, and, and, and this violence. And here comes the azure of the Lord. I am sending you the Chaldeans. And then it calls a back with a more confusion, perplexity. He says, Lord, I know you're holy. You're eternal. How come would you use this wicked nation to punish a righteous nation? Now that, at first you may, you seem to, uh, uh, you know, see that it's a, um, like a contradiction from Habakkuk because he was just complaining of what's happening in Judah. He was just referring of a lesser wicked nation. And then he said here, describing how the Babylonians treats their enemies. He says in, in verse 14, you make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. And then verse 15, he brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them with his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad, therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury, and his food is rich. And then in verse 17, is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Are you just going to let them do what they're doing, Lord? And so verse 1, if you notice uh, in the reading earlier, then in verse 1, this is Habakkuk saying, I will take my stand at the watch post and station myself on a tower, a watchtower. You know, it's it's where it's a a, uh, structure. Uh, Some they put it in the field um, so that they can see, you know, some predators or, or against those who would steal their flocks there's another a watchtower where it's placed on the uh, corners of the city wall so it's it's where they oversee whether there's an enemy coming and so habakkuk here says i will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what the lord will say to me And then the Lord in His grace answered. Look at verse 2. The Lord answered me, Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. 
For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Now, uh, it's just interesting here how that the Lord answered Habakkuk's uh, question, uh, complaint, how long? And then he's using the Chaldeans as his rod of just judgment to Judah. And then he said, For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Remember, God's timing is always perfect. It comes in the right time. It's not early. It's not late. It comes in the exact time. Probably one of the hardest things we do as believers is the waiting. The waiting. But God said in verse 4, Behold, his soul is puffed up. Referring, I would, be, I would submit to you, the Babylonians. They're puffed up. It is not a pride within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Did you know that this is actually the, the, the corn, the, this passage was the very passage that it started the Reformation? Martin Luther? But it is interesting how that the apostle, Paul, used this verse in Romans chapter 1 and in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. Okay. And um, it says here in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, from beginning to end. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. In the context of the gospel. Galatians 3, verse 10 to 11. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. Again, in the context of the gospel. Very clear, verse 11. It is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. Remember Ephesians chapter 2? For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Even faith is a gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. Just imagine if a person is saved by works. We have a ton of arrogant people in heaven. Because instead of kneeling before God and worshiping Him and thanking Him for graciously saving him or her, He will come with all arrogance and says, Lord, I did this, I did that. But even faith is a gift of God. Now, in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews took that verse and used it in the context of perseverance. Listen, pastor read it earlier. It was, uh, it was indeed a blessing just to hear it. Verse 37 to 39, For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. 
But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Before 37 to 39, if you read uh, the, the previous verses, he was commending those uh, believers who have stayed on the course in spite their properties were confiscated, in spite that some of them were put to prison, in spite of them being put to shame because of being Christians. And then he quotes this, that the righteous one shall live by faith. Now, the way Habakkuk uh, uh, gave us here the word faith, the righteous one shall live by his faith, it's more of the righteous one shall live by his faithfulness or steadfastness. That's in the Hebrew. And in the, in, in here in the New Testament, how they used it is interesting because it is the faith, the trust, believe. That's why it's in the context of the gospel, Paul used it. Here in the writer of Hebrews, he used it in the context of perseverance for believers of Jesus Christ. I will touch more later. Now, from verse 6 up to verse 20, I'm not going to, uh, um, unfortunately, because of time, um, God said, because the issue, the second complaint of Habakkuk was this, Lord, will you allow them to continue what they're doing? God said, no, they have their time. They will be judged. Why? Because here, from verse 6 down to verse 20, are the five woes. The five woes to Babylon. Not only Babylon, but the nations who practice such things will be like Babylon. From verse 6 to 8, woe to the extortioner. From verse 9 through 11, Woe to the greedy and arrogant. From verse 12 to 14, woe to those who build on bloodshed. And verse 15 to 17, woe to the drunk and violent. And from verse 18 to 20, woe to the maker of an idol. It says here, uh, I'd like to... Look into this, the last one. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. But, you see the contrast there, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. The Lord is in his holy temple. Now, this is, it doesn't, doesn't say that uh, the, the Lord is in the literal temple, the Jerusalem temple or Solomon's temple, but this is a, a, another term that refers to God's throne in heaven and not Solomon's temple. Psalm 11 verse 4 says, The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, His eyelids test the children of man. Micah chapter 1 verse 2, Hear you peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from His holy temple. And as the Lord is in His holy temple, the call is, be silent before Him. Oh, be silent before Him. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 13. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for He has roused Himself from His holy dwelling. Now, the last part. Observations from this text. Two things. Two things. 
First, it's about the sovereignty of God. Now, we all have definitions of, we hear and we read about the definitions of, of the sovereignty of God. As I was reading uh, uh, some, you know, some theological books about how they define the sovereignty of God, I just ended up myself uh, snoring. <laughs> but, um, you know, some, uh, one of my prayers this week was actually, uh, Lord, please restart my brain. And so, uh, one of the, 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 the theologians that, that I appreciate, and, you know, in, in his, how he defined the sovereignty of God, I know if you heard about John Frame, and he said, the sovereignty of God is the fact that He is the Lord over creation. As sovereign, He exercises His rule. This rule is exercised through God's authority as King, his control over all things, and His presence with His covenantal people and throughout His creation. In the layman's, um, uh, I think I, um, I erased it, but yeah, in the layman's uh, term, I know I, I erased it, sorry, but it was from... Uh, from Johnny Erickson Tada, which is similar with, with how John Frame defined it. But again, it is the fact that he is Lord over creation and he exercises rule. And this rule is exercised through God's authority as king, his control, control over all things, his presence with his covenantal people. And that's why you know, Habakkuk here. He knows God. He, he's a prophet by, by his experience, by his life. Every day, he experiences how God uh, 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 works throughout history. I would submit Habakkuk is very well versed of the Exodus, very well versed of the judges, the kings. And of course, very well versed of creation. That's why here in verse 12 to, to, to 13, you'll see here, he's a theologian. He says, Lord, you're from everlasting. You are the Holy One. You are the Lord, my God. You have ordained. You are the rock. You have established you who are of pure eyes. That's why he cannot comprehend, understand the fact that God would use an evil nation to punish Judah. That's why the question the question is, how sovereign is the sovereignty of God? How sovereign is the sovereignty of God? Now, that's a very wide topic to discuss. But in this book, and what do you notice here? How God demonstrated His sovereignty? Listen. Listen. God used evil to punish evil. God used evil to punish evil. That might surprise some of us, huh? But I hope that the sovereignty of God will bring comfort to us, especially in the wickedness and the evil that we see. Do you remember the time in the book of Job when in chapter 1 the sons of God appeared before the throne of God? Somehow the devil was there. What did God say? Have you seen my servant Job? No one like him. 
How does the devil respond? Let me take away all his belongings or his properties and he will curse you. You see that conversation? How did the devil ask permission to the sovereign God? God said, okay, don't take away his life. Sometimes we are, because we are bombarded with the fact that what we watch, what we hear, it seems that wickedness has been triumphant. But let me tell you this. The Word of God prophesies it. I mean, the Word of God says, Paul says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. It says, don't give up. Sometimes we, uh, I don't know, most, some of us have been familiar with um, Star Wars, right? Where we have the, uh, the first, I remember, that was a long time ago. Um, I don't know how, I don't want to say how long, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> um, Star Wars, right? Part two was Empire Strikes Back, and then the last one was Return of the Jedi. And, um, you know, the, the producer, director of that somehow has uh, um, subtly um, indoctrinated or put some doctrine there, the doctrine of dualism. Remember, there's a fight between good and evil. Good is defeated at times, and then, but then returns back. Let me tell you this. In God, even evil is dependent on God. You know how God is sovereign? He is so sovereign that even wickedness is dependent on Him. The devil. devil is not independent of God. His very existence is even dependent on the living and sovereign God. That's why the second part here is this. Before I read the second part, uh, I, I saw the uh, quotation here. He says, Nothing is a surprise to God. Nothing is a setback to His plans. Nothing can thwart His purposes. And nothing is beyond His control. His sovereignty is absolute. Everything that happens is uniquely ordained by God. Sovereignty is a weighty thing to ascribe to the nature and character of God. Yet if He were not sovereign, He would not be God. The Bible is clear that God is in control of everything that happens. This is from Joni Tada Erickson. And so the second observation is this, in connection with the first one, the Christian and the problem of evil. The Christian and the problem of evil. Now, we're not, I'm not going to delve on uh, through the lens of, you know, uh, an unbeliever that has been addressed in our apologetics class, and praise the Lord for that. But here is through the lens of a believer of Jesus Christ, a follower of the cross. And we know, we know this, you know, if, if, if the problem of evil, if you looked at it as a, a, through the lens of a believer, and praise the Lord for that because we learned it from God's word. Remember that story from the beginning when God made a beautiful garden and after six days 
Uh, he created everything by his word. But by man, he created him from dust of the ground. And he gave bread into the nostrils of man. Man became a living soul. And he commanded, he, he made man as a co-regent over his creation. He says, you can you, uh, enjoy the garden, everything in it, enjoy the fruits of the garden, except for one. Some would look at it as a test. But I also looked at it, and I submit to you, as putting man in his proper place. We know the story. They disobeyed. Man disobeyed God. And I look in, uh, just looking into it, it's not just simply a sin of disobedience, but a sin of, sin of treason. How can one commit this to a gracious and merciful and good and kind God? So they were expelled in the garden, but before they were expelled in the garden, God made a promise of a seed that will come out from the woman. So from then on, they were looking forward for that promised seed. The picture of Abraham offering his son Isaac was a perfect illustration of what that promised seed will do because there was a ram who took the place of Isaac. And so they were looking forward, the lamb, to offer it. More cemented uh, in the time of the Exodus, if you remember, the blood of the lamb posted, was, was put on the post of the door, and the angel of death will, what? Pass over. Years have come. There is no waiting for that Messiah. The prophets have been proclaiming that the Messiah will come. Jesus came. And in dramatic fashion, in the river Jordan, when John the Baptist was performing his, his, his preaching and his baptism, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who, took, who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus the perfect God-man performed miracles, healed the sick, made the blind to see again, made the lame to walk again, which is perfect with, with, with what the Messiah is about to do, or it's doing, it's going to do. To make the long story short, he was arrested, and accusations were false. And he died. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and rose again on the third day. It's just interesting because prior to his death, where was Jesus prior to his arrest? He was in a garden, he was praying. Not my will, but your be done. The exact opposite of what the first man did. Death could not contain the Son of God. God raised him from the dead and now has ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father. That's why when we always sing that, is he worthy, I just can't help but really worship and praise God. And he will come back again and will make everything right. There will be the new heaven and the new earth and we'll be in his presence forever. Now, I believe it. As believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we uh, do not uh, deny the fact that there is evil present. We have in our prayer time about abortion. I mean, who on earth that in our stage of, of this, in, in our years as a nation, we, it's just, abortion is just normal. 
We see corruption. We see oppression. Now, I'm not going to be, uh, uh, but the oppression of God's people. Sometimes I'm, I'm afraid to read the voice of the martyrs because after I read it, I just, I, I'm, I'm just put to shame. Because we have brethren, brothers and sisters of Christ who have been persecuted, put it to prison. I guess the issue of, the, of, 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 of evil is not more of recognizing the fact that there's evil But for a believer of Jesus Christ, the question will be like Habakkuk. Lord, how long? When is this going to end? Let me read Revelation chapter 6. This is when the Lamb broke the seal. Now we are on the fifth seal. It says here, verse 9, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. How long? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until, interesting, until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be Complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Now, after reading that, I actually brought chills to me. Because there's a set of number, huh? It's not on the, on the presence of evil that we're more concerned. It's more of, When, Lord, are you coming and make all things right? God said, For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Christ will come. But the call for his people is to live the just, the righteous one shall live by his faithfulness. Now, there may be times where the days are so dark Things that we don't understand. Why? Why are these things happening? But may this word, I like even this, this, this verse, it says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Not only speaks of his throne, of where he is, but it answers the question, where was God When tragedies, when circumstances that are not favorable, when wickedness happens, where is God? Here's the answer. He is in His holy throne. He is in the very same place when Jesus was crucified. And He will still be in the same place when His Son will come back again and will make everything new. May we be, may we rest on the fact that our Lord is sovereign. 
may we rest on the fact that one day we look forward for that coming that God will make everything right. But while we're here, I urge you, brothers and sisters in the Lord, be faithful. Because we must not shrink, but we must go on. Father, thank you. I pray, Father, that uh, may your word encourage each one today. May your word teach us, rebuke us, but also encourage us, Lord. I ask, Lord, that may you give grace to each one I know maybe some of us here are asking those questions why and asking those questions when. Father, help us and be reminded that we are to live not only by faith in Christ but also by faithfulness. To remain steadfast till the time that you'll come. And even, Lord, as a church, may we be faithful May we continue to be a light in this very dark community, a community that desperately needs the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for your encouragement for our pastors. Pray for your encouragement for your people here at CCC. In your son's name, amen.